all these covenants are under the umbrella of the covenant of grace so that we have unity of the covenant leading to the new covenant where the mediator is no longer the first Adam. The mediator is the second Adam, namely Jesus Christ. Well, it's our second lecture, lecture two, the unity of the covenants. And let's open in prayer. Father, we praise you for clarity and for the perfections of the Bible. That from Genesis to Revelation, we have a perfect testimony, perfect revelation. The canon itself is sufficient for us, for every good work in ministry. So we pray you would open our eyes that we would behold wonderful things and see you more clearly and beautifully, Lord Jesus. We pray in your name, amen. We've begun with the plan of God and salvation. Now looking at the unity of the covenants, it's important to see all the Bible as preaching, proclaiming, putting forth Christ in the Old Testament in types and signs, on prophecies and promises, and then in the New Testament with fulfillment and ongoing explanation and revelation of how he continues to do and live uh, and work uh, in a glorious way. Uh, in the area of salvation itself, continuing to apply the benefits of the cross. And so in the unity of the covenants now, I want to just remind you, if not inform you for the first time, of the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. That in Genesis chapter 2, God established with the first man, Adam, the covenant of works, whereby if Adam obeyed perfectly and did not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, then he would win for all humanity life. But if he sinned, if he fell, if he transgressed, then he would, uh, we would all fall in him. We would lose original righteousness. We'd be marked by shame and guilt, blame shifting, and uh, and what follows with the masculine and feminine curse in Genesis 3. And so the covenant of works is federal headship in Adam, the first man. The covenant of grace, then, is the remainder of the Bible. Beginning in Genesis 3, God first curses the serpent, or Satan, and promises that in this war between the seed or the offspring of the serpent and the seed or offspring of the woman, in this war, one will come through the seed of the woman, chapter, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, one will come and he will crush Satan's head. This is fulfilled on the cross showing that the work of the cross is first and foremost about spiritual warfare and about destroying the destroyer, destroying death itself, but also destroying Satan in a, in a remarkable and definitive way. And so thus begins for humanity the covenant of grace that all in the Old Testament are saved in the same way as in the New Testament. Though the gospel is administered differently in each of the covenants, it is all the same gospel. One people of God, even though God established the Jews as his people to bring forth the gospel and to administer it in different types and signs of Christ. In each case, it is repentance and faith as the instrumental means of salvation through faith in the coming Messiah and for us in the Messiah or the Christ that came. 
And so all the covenants, including the Noahic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the covenant with Abraham in Genesis 12, remains uh, under this covenant of grace. All these covenants, the covenant with David in 2 Samuel 7, all these covenants are under the umbrella of the covenant of grace so that we have unity of the covenants leading to the new covenant where the mediator is no longer the first Adam, the mediator is the second Adam, namely Jesus Christ. And so uh, I just want to briefly review a few things. One is that in the unity of the covenant, we have Christ and his salvation uh, put forth centrally through his people. Uh, whereas the Mosaic covenant is abrogated, the covenant with Abraham remains. This is Paul's point in the letter of Galatians that it is the covenant with Adam or Abraham that remains and it is by faith in Christ that we are credited with righteousness. More on that later. And other ways of viewing the Bible arose in the history of the church. For example, there was the heretic Marcion who did not believe that the Bible was taken to be taken as a whole for the people of God today, but he began with just the letters of Paul in the book of Acts saying that the rest was not applicable to us. There are other ways that have viewed the Bible that destroyed this sense of unity of the covenant. And one that came out in the late 1800s and in the 1900s spread very fast and far in world missions out of England and the United States was dispensationalism. And dispensationalism became more popular through the Ryrie Study Bible and in this old dispensationalism, uh, it was taught that there were seven dispensations or times. And these were taught in a way that put into doubt that God had one eternal plan of salvation, one people of God in all ages. The seven tests were as follows. The dispensationalists argued that there was first the dispensation of innocence, Genesis 1, 28 through Genesis 3, verse 24, that man was tested first to be innocent and remain sinless, and because he failed, dispensationalism, the older dispensationalism, seem to teach that God came up with another plan of salvation after each time man failed. The second dispensation was the dispensation of conscience, Genesis 4 through Genesis 8, verse 14. And in this case, man again failed with conscience alone for obedience. And so then God comes up with another seemingly plan of salvation. And that was what they call the dispensation of promise with Abraham from Genesis 12 to Exodus chapter 18 in the time just before the Mosaic covenant. And in this case as well, they argue that the believers failed to trust and live out the uh, test in each case, there's a failure. So after innocence and conscience, I'm sorry, the third is human government, which I left out, Genesis 8 to 11. Then the dispensation of promise. And then the dispensation of law under Moses 
And that goes all the way from Exodus 19 to Acts chapter 1, verse 26. Here again, man failed. In this dispensa dispensation, the people of God, the Jews, were tested to see if they would welcome the Messiah. And when they didn't and rejected the Christ, then that dispensation was, in a sense, postponed until the dispensationalists teach until the millennium, a literal thousand years where Christ will come again and rule in Jerusalem on the throne of David. And again, the sacrifices will be applied of animals and blood for the remission of sin. In the meantime, since the dispensation of law, the people of God failed, the plan of salvation became a dispensation of grace from Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to Revelation, they argue, chapter 19, verse 21, in which uh, the gospel of faith and repentance in Jesus Christ spreads amongst the Gentiles or the non-Jews to all the nations, at which time that will end in failure and then the final dispensation, they argue, of the kingdom begins after a secret rapture of believers, a seven-year tribulation follows, a literal 1,000 years. Then, as I mentioned before, this too ends in failure and a great rebellion, and then the end comes. The danger with dispensationalism versus the unity of the covenant in the covenant of works the covenant of grace, is that in the covenant of works and grace, there is one gospel, one mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ between God and man. In the dispensational schema, it implies that the cross of Jesus Christ was not necessary for salvation for they argue that the sacrifices in the Old Testament are sufficient for salvation for the Jews. Then, since they rejected the Messiah and his kingship, it's postponed to the literal thousand years when Jesus will come in the millennium. And again, the sacrifices are reinstituted for salvation. And so they they don't make the cross absolutely necessary for salvation, but see it as a means of salvation for the Gentiles during this dispensation of grace, as they call it. And this is uh, sad because it creates two peoples of God, two gospels, the people of God being the Jews and their gospel through animal sacrifice, and then the Gentiles and the gospel of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so uh, it seems to be uh, lacking unity in the covenant and in the message of the apostles. I bring that up just to remind you or teach you of the dangers of not seeing Christ as central in all the scriptures with one gospel and the cross of Christ being central in the one people of God. I want to uh, speak next on the unity of the covenants to look at the Old Testament's three major offices. So as the people of God related to God, God set up three Mediator, mediators between God and man who all pointed to Jesus Christ, the one true mediator between God and man uh, in the covenant of grace that existed since Genesis chapter 3. And these three offices are the office of the prophet, the priest, and the king. The Puritans in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question and answer 
23, the question reads, what offices does Christ execute as our Redeemer? Answer, Christ as our Redeemer executes the offices of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king in his estate of humiliation and in his estate of exaltation. So it doesn't end. It continues in both his uh, incarnational and living on earth until the resurrection and in the exaltation. He continues to exist as the mediator in this covenant of grace between God and man as prophet, priest, and king. Now this idea actually came from the reformer Jean Calvin in French, or John Calvin. And he spoke of the threefold office, prophet, priest, and king, as a means of understanding the person and work of Christ in salvation. And he devoted one chapter in the Institutes of the Christian Religion, that would be Book 2, Chapter 15, Sections 1 through 6. In setting forth the biblical data that demonstrates Jesus to be God's consummate prophet, the great high priest, and the all-powerful king of kings. So the three offices of Christ are prefigured in the Old Testament. Each of them points ahead to Christ in whom these three offices would be gloriously fulfilled. First Timothy Chapter 2, verse 5, says there's no other mediator between God and man except the Lord Jesus Christ. So first, Christ functions as God's prophet. He reveals the will of God to us, and he speaks in God's name with God's full authority. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, Moses had prophesied and promised that the prophet would come, not just any prophet, but the prophet would come and be amongst uh, the people of God. So that when John the Baptist was so popular in John chapter 2, authorities were sent from Jerusalem to ask him questions. And one of the questions was, are you the prophet? Of which he said, no. For Jesus is the prophet, and in the transfiguration and so forth, the Father says from heaven, here's my son, listen to him. He's the prophet. In Acts chapter 3, 22 through 23, Peter applies the Deuteronomy 18 verse 15 passage to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the final and ultimate prophet. And his prophetic office continues on through the work of the Holy Spirit when he illumines our minds to understand and believe those things that he promises in his word. There's a picture of this in the road to Emmaus with the two apostles or two uh, disciples that he meets along the way. He opens their minds and they say, Did not our hearts burn within us? So, second, Christ's priestly office. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1, defines for us what the high priest is to do for God's people. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. And this very thing lies at the heart of Christ's redemptive work in the New Testament. He offers up not just a lamb as a sacrificial uh, atonement for sins, but he offers himself up as the Lamb of God. As in the New Covenant Institute of the Lord's Supper, we have the continuation of the Passover, we have the leavened bread, and we have the wine, and as he institutes the Lord's Supper or communion in the New Covenant, the one thing missing 
in this in the elements was the Lamb of God. The Lamb's blood put over the doorpost of the heart of the house so that the angel of death would pass over. This was a picture of Christ. So in the Lord's Supper you have the bread and the wine, but Jesus himself is the Passover lamb. Regarding Christ in his kingly office, as the eternal Son of God whose throne, throne is firmly established forever in heaven, Psalm 103, verse 19, Christ rules over his people as well as over the heavens, over the earth, and over all creation. And in the Old Testament, the Davidic kingdom pointed ahead to Christ's conquest over death and the grave. So that 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 14, when Nathan the prophet tells David that his throne will last forever, but he says, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father. He shall be to me a son. So in this promise and covenant to David, David's own royal offspring, the Lord Jesus Christ, as Matthew 1 and Luke 2, uh, Luke 3 genealogies tell us, that this is Christ himself, or in the Pentecost sermon in Acts chapter 2, Peter tells us this prophecy is fulfilled in Christ's resurrection and ascension. ascension. Acts chapter 2, 30 through 33. I want to have you turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. And I'd like us to just meditate here on the significance of the unity of the two covenants, the covenant of works, the covenant of grace, in the two Adams. Adam, the first man created, and the second Adam, which is Paul's language in Corinthians, and his main idea and doctrine in Romans chapter 5 in verses 12 through 21. So chapter 5, verse 12 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who is to come, namely Jesus Christ. But the free gift is not like the, trans, the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of the one man Jesus Christ abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, Adam, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so the one act of righteousness leads to justification and for life of all men in Christ. For, as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many are made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, 
so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now the context of Romans chapter 5, 12 through 21, is that there was division and tension between the Jews who had come to faith and the Gentiles who had come to faith now in the one church of Jesus Christ in Rome. And based on ethnicity, there was tension and division. The argument of the book of Romans says there's a division not based on ethnicity, but rather on two humanities, based on two men, based on two representative people, two Adam, Adam and Christ. And the purpose is to show how the grace of God in Christ has come to reign over all humanity. Now, there was a, the Prime Minister Winston Churchill in 1940 in August after the Battle of Britain. Uh, there were many saved by a few pilots. And these Uh, Air Force pilots uh, were honored with the following words from the Prime Minister. He said, never have so many owed their lives to so few. And Paul, after the battle over humanity, is saying, never have so many owed their lives to the only one, Jesus Christ. So I want to look at this passage and consider the grace of God in the unity of the covenant. First, the exchange of representatives, Adam and Christ. Second, the exchange of shuns, playing on words a bit, but condemnation for justification. And three, the exchange of reign the reign of death and sin replaced by the reign of life and grace. First, the exchange of representatives. The two covenants between God and humanity representing all of us by a mediator. So the covenant of works with Adam, a real historical man, conditioned upon perfect obedience, verse 12 of chapter 5, all fell in Adam, and in that sin, original sin, we all were guilty in Adam. Even though we weren't there, we have an alien guilt, a guilt we weren't there, we didn't commit the trespass, yet the Bible says in Romans 5 that when Adam sinned, we all sinned. And we all have what's called original guilt. The object, you might say, how could I be counted guilty in Adam's first sin? Well, this is the way the Bible puts it, is that Adam represented all humanity. We don't like that there's alien guilt, that we are guilty in Adam, but when we are in Christ, by faith in Christ, the second Adam, we like that we are all made righteous, even though none of us have been righteous. But it's the righteousness of Christ that's imputed to us and received by faith alone. Secondly, the exchange from condemnation to justification. In verses 16 and 17, we read, And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For the judgment following the one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. So in Adam, condemnation. In Christ, justification. In Adam, by birth. In Christ, by faith. Abundance of grace, we read in verse 17. In Adam, the garden became a wilderness. 
In Christ, the wilderness becomes a garden. Adam lost righteousness. In Christ, we've gained righteousness. Adam lost access to the presence of God. In Christ, we've gained access into the presence of God. And third, the exchange of reigns or ruling reigns, R-E-I-G-N-S. Verse 17 says, For if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So death reigned and ruled, you might say, through Adam. Grace rules and reigns abundantly in Christ. And so you notice in verse 19, in Adam were made sinners, in Christ were made righteous. So that we can pray, Lord, I am pardoned of all my sins and accepted as righteous in your sight, but only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to me and received by faith alone. And this is justification. And the doctrine of justification comes from the first off Romans or Genesis 12, uh, Genesis 15, verse 6, for example, Genesis 15, 6, Abraham was credited righteous when he believed, not because he was righteous in his own, but by faith alone. Paul picks up on that, and Romans and Galatians and Philippians is all about this doctrine. The righteousness that we have is because Christ lived a righteous life for 33 years, and that righteous life is given to us in exchange. Our unrighteousness, our self-righteousness was laid on him, the sacrifice, the Lamb of God on the cross. He paid the price and removed all that and restores to us righteousness, freedom, and grace. So the exchange in Romans chapter 5, 12 through 21, the exchange of representatives, no longer under Adam, but under the second Adam, Christ, the exchange of from condemnation to justification, and the reign of sin and death is exchanged with the reign of life and grace. Let's take time now just to have question and answer, and this ends lecture two, the unity of the covenant. I'm giving you everything.